to our latest. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our presentation for today. We're lucky for today at uh, the kickoff of Heart Month to have with us uh, our friend and colleague, Dr. Rob Osfeld, Professor of Medicine and Director of Preventive Cardiology here at the Montefiore Health System. I think when you look at Rob's um, clinical and research output, you find really a seamless transition between a passion for a research investigation and the day-to-day -day practice. And if you just look at some of Rob's accomplishments in the last year, uh, multiple CME talks, multiple presentations in, in peer-reviewed publications, and, um, and a podcast known as Cardio Nutrition with the ACC, which has, um, which has uh, viewership, which is basically outstripping almost everybody else on the ACC. So without further ado, I think it's our pleasure to hear today from, Rock, from Dr. Osfeld. Those of you who listen routinely to these lectures on this station and on this channel, know full well about the spectrum of uh, technological accomplishments that our cardiovascular division is able to achieve in structural heart, in interventional, in heart failure and transplant, and in EP. But I think one of the things that really distinguishes not only the field of cardiology, but our division is our emphasis and the strength of our prevention uh, enterprises and efforts. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Oswald. Well, Dr. Vorschheimer, thank you so much for that incredibly um, generous introduction. And I echo the sentiment about our uh, division. It is really a wonderful team. And it's fun to sometimes see the recommendations. Like I'll read a note and sometimes the surgeons will recommend cabbage and, and I'll also recommend cabbage. So it's really, it's pretty seamless <laughs> between everybody. Um, and so <clears throat> it's a real honor to be here today. Uh, thank you, Millie. A uh, plant-based diet and cardiovascular health is what we'll talk about. And we, of course, have a cardiac wellness program here with the goal of preventing disease with a plant-based diet. And it's got, uh, and oh, hopefully I'll have a chance to talk about this a little bit toward the end, an educational arm, a research arm, and uh, a clinical arm. And, you know, I, I probably my experience is very similar to uh, many of yours where, you know, through med school, residency, fellowship, all that, I had a chance to learn from wonderful people and all kinds of great stuff, procedures, pathophysiology, medications, but really had very limited exposure to nutrition. At least that was my experience. And I kind of knew when I was done that eating a Mediterranean style diet was healthful, but I couldn't quite define it. And that was pretty much about it. And when I came to uh, Montefiore many, many years ago, um, I would encourage people to have a Mediterranean style diet and use procedures and medications and people would get better and we see wonderful things happen. But sometimes it seemed like the disease, underlying disease process of cardiovascular disease would continue to march forward, which is a common theme throughout the Western world, unfortunately. And so I was kind of getting a little disillusioned. And then I learned about the impact of a plant-based diet. And, you know, I've been a cardiologist now for, gosh, I don't know, 18 or so years. And outside of a medical emergency, like somebody gets shot and has to be put back together again, I've never seen anything come close to the breadth and depth of benefits that a plant-based diet provides. Um, and in our program, like there are literally patients crying tears of joy. They feel so much better. And like nobody cries tears of joy and I write them a prescription for a Torvastat. Um, but uh, so... I hope you'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about our program. And uh, this will just uh, a brief talk. Uh, and of course, as you know, cardiovascular disease, heart, heart attack, stroke is exquisitely common. I have to update the slide with the new AHA guideline or our numbers that just came out, but it's not tremendously different, unfortunately. And about two heart attacks happen every minute in the US. I'm sure all of your CCUs, cardiology floors are bustling with heart attack patients, unfortunately. Um, it is cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of adult men and adult women in the US, a title no one wants. Um, and women are about six to seven times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than they are from breast cancer. Now, clearly you do not want either one, but it highlights the epidemiologic importance of cardiovascular disease in women. And for some reason, that public health message doesn't seem to have fully connected. Um, and it's obviously an exquisitely expensive um, uh, uh, disease process. So there's an incredible, although it's exquisitely common, and there are pathologic studies that show that 
uh, in the Western world, uh, up to 65% of 12 to 14 year olds have very early signs of coronary atherosclerosis. And I'm sure you all are familiar with those famous autopsy studies of our soldiers from the Korean War and the Vietnam War that showed 50 to 70-ish percent of them had overt coronary artery disease. These are, you know, 21-year-old soldiers. So <clears throat> there's a, there's a, that's depressing, but there's an incredible opportunity as well. And we are all part of it, uh, a, a big part of it. And 90% of the risk for heart attack can be accounted for by the following nine risk factors. And most of them are meaningfully impacted by diet, abnormal lipids, smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, abdominal obesity, which is probably more of a metric of uh, visceral, visceral fat, psychosocial factors, consumption of fruits and vegetables, alcohol, and regular physical activity. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to bend the curve. This is a really cool study by uh, Dr. Bundy in, in circulation earlier this year. And they took American Heart Association's Life Simple 7, seven lifestyle factors that they really wanna emphasize. Um, and so of course, smoking, body mass index, physical activity, healthy diet, cholesterol, blood pressure, hemoglobin A1C, we're all very familiar that those are extremely important. And in a data set of about 11,000 people, they looked, they defined a poor, intermediate, or ideal score. And they gave them a score of zero, one, or two. Okay, so the healthy diet score, how'd they come up with that? Well, so the way they defined a healthy diet score is a healthy diet meant having four and, a, four and a half or more servings of fruits and vegetables a day, three or more servings of whole grains each day. Um, it was low salt, uh, uh, low sugar sweetened beverages, and two or more servings of fatty fish a week. That's how they defined a healthy diet. And if you had four or five of those components, then you had in a, you met in their definition an ideal diet score. It doesn't seem like a huge hurdle. 0.7 percent of a representative sample of the U.S. had an ideal diet. We are so far from being where we need to be. And along those lines, there are often these interesting fights about which diet most be most extra extra optimal. It's a distraction. We're a mile away from any of that. Um, and how about a poor diet score, which was zero to one components of those five? 75% of the US have a poor diet. We have a really long way to go to get better. And what might happen if we do get better? Oh, actually, before I get to that, sorry. The, um, they looked at a total cardiovascular health score for those seven numbers, zero, one, two, 12 to 14 is high, zero to eight is low. So high, moderate, or low. 7.5% or so of the entire U.S. has a high cardiovascular health score, over 50% low. We have a long way to go. What happens if we get to where we need to be? For example, if you look at just the healthy diet score, if everybody in that cohort switched, if everybody switched to an ideal diet, that would lower cardiovascular event rates over the course of a year they modeled by over 40%. What if everybody got to ideal blood pressure by about 40%? There is a ton of opportunity out there. And the good news is each of us are at the front lines dealing with that with our patients on a day-to-day -day basis, with, with the education that we provide our trainees, uh, impacting our systems and, and, and larger societies. So it's a, it's a wonderful uh, responsibility. Um, and you know, it's really never too early to start. There, this is an interesting analysis of the CARDIA study, the coronary artery risk development in young adults, uh, plant-centered diet and risk of incident cardiovascular disease during young to middle adulthood. And in this analysis, uh, started with about 5,000 subjects, 18 to 30 years of age, free of cardiovascular disease. And if you, over 30 years of follow-up, if you consume the highest on average versus lowest quintile of a plant-based diet, you had a 52% lower hazard of developing cardiovascular disease. And it's really never too late to start because if you change your diet from your, excuse me, your seven to year 20, comparing quintiles, if you went to the highest quintile at year 20, you had about a 61% lower hazard. Uh, so it's really never too early to begin and never too late to start. And not surprisingly, it all goes together, the different lifestyle changes, it's sort of, they add up and help each other. So conjoint association of adherence to physical activity and dietary guidelines with cardiometabolic health. 
This is the experience from the Framingham Heart Study. And they were looking at metabolic syndrome in about 2,300 people with eight years of follow-up. And if you adhere to, the two, adhere to the 2018 physical activity guidelines for Americans, you had about a 34% lower hazard of developing metabolic syndrome. That's nice. If you adhere to the 2015 dietary guidelines for Americans, about a 32% lower hazard. And I forgot to put the number in if you adhere to both, but it's meaningfully lower still. Um, okay, and we often will talk about, well, you know, there's a diabetes diet, and there's a cancer diet, and there's a heart disease diet. Not really. They all kind of go together. There's a healthful dietary pattern, which would, you know, also be wholly consistent with the American College of Cardiology guidelines, where they really recommend a healthful dietary pattern, plant-based diet being one of them, but, but they're all generally largely plant-based. A Mediterranean-style diet, which in its true form is largely plant-based, is, of course, another very healthful dietary pattern. Um, so looking at this analysis, this is future risk of cancer by atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease score. I thought it was interesting. And you know that score that we, we plug in through, for the, through the ACC, through the app, um, and it, you know, high blood pressure, blood pressure impacts it, cholesterol impacts it. These are things that are impacted by diet and lifestyle. And so here, if you look, the higher your atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk score, you the higher your future risk of developing cancer. They all kind of go together. So let's walk through a plant-based diet and how that may impact various health metrics, cardiovascular health, cholesterol, inflammation, blood pressure, weight, diabetes, novel risk factors in quality of life, and mortality. So how am I defining a plant-based diet? I'm really talking about minimally processed plant-based foods. And of course, we don't need to have perfection be the enemy of good. Someone wants to go 60% of the way there, have at it. It's better than 10% of the way there. And so I'm talking about tons of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, tofu, yams, nuts, and seeds, um, getting rid of the junk food. And actually interesting along the lines of junk food, there's a very interesting analysis in Jack by Jewel this year that looked at the Framingham cohort, about three or so thousand people in the Framingham cohort. And the average person in the Framingham cohort ate seven and a half servings of ultra processed foods each day. That's like a bag of chips, a sugar soda, seven and a half a day. Like we have a long way to go. And not surprisingly, the more ultra processed foods you ate, the worse you get. Okay. So of course the devil's in the details. We're talking smartly or minimally processed plant-based foods. And uh, so, and they, but to put some teeth around that, there's a wonderful analysis by Satija published in Jack in 2017 uh, using the uh, Nurses Health Study 1, Study 2, and Physicians Health Study uh, cohorts. And they said, okay, well, if you eat a plant-based diet, more and more of a plant-based diet, is that helpful? Well, the more of a plant-based diet you ate, it was helpful for coronary heart disease. But there's got to be a difference between cookies and kale, right? I mean, so that's what kind of what they ask. So here they ask is what happens if you eat a healthy plant-based diet or an unhealthy plant-based diet, the kale, the cookies? Well, if you ate a healthy plant-based diet, you did even better. But if you ate an unhealthy plant-based diet, you did worse. And if you look over here, this is the healthy plant-based diet. The more you ate, the better you did. This is the hatched line here is an unhealthy plant-based diet, but this red line, that's an animal-based diet. So an unhealthy plant-based diet numerically was even worse than an animal-based diet here. And accordingly, uh, there's a meta-analysis uh, published in Lancet by Reynolds in 2019, looking at whole grain consumption and consuming more whole grains was associated with less, less diabetes, yes, less diabetes, less cancer, less uh, cardiovascular disease, emphasizing the importance of uh, smartly or minimally processed foods. So this is a wonderful analysis by Dr. Dew out of the New England Journal of Medicine published in 2016. And what, uh, with a cohort of like 500, 450,000 people with 3.2 million years of follow-up. And they asked, if you eat more fresh fruit, is it good? Is it not good? Well, in this analysis, it turns out it's good. The more fresh fruit you eat, the less cardiovascular disease, the less coronary events, the less stroke, less hemorrhagic stroke. Um, so impressive. And Let's have, and furthermore, in regard to stroke, the quality of a plant-based diet, meaning the devil's in the details, and risk of total ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. And here, if you have the highest quintile 
of a healthy plant-based diet index, you had about a 10% lower hazard of stroke uh, and um, a 5% increased hazard, although not statistically significant for an unhealthy plant-based diet index. Erectile uh, dysfunction is also, of course, largely a manifestation of cardiovascular disease. Vasculogenic erectile dysfunction is the most common form. Clearly, it could be for other non-vascular reasons as well. But we call often erectile dysfunction the, cor uh, the canary in the coal mine for coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease because it typically occurs about two to three years before angina sets in and three to five years before cardiovascular events set in. And there are clear randomized uh, controlled trials looking at a Mediterranean style diet, looking at exercise, comparing it to a more Western style diet and lifestyle where uh, doing those things, Mediterranean style diet, exercise, weight loss can improve, significantly improve erectile function. And it's exquisitely common looking at these numbers here, uh, but I suspect it's even more common um, because people just don't want to talk about it. And impact of a plant-based diet, we talked a little bit about its impact on cardiovascular health, heart disease, stroke, erectile function. Let's touch a little bit on cholesterol, inflammation, and blood pressure. So this is a direct comparison of a dietary portfolio of cholesterol-lowering foods with a statin in hypercholesterolemic patients. And it's by Dr. Jenkins. He does wonderful work in this arena. And a dietary portfolio is basically a high-fiber plant-based diet. And they randomized just 34 people to a control diet. Always good to have a control because you can see an LDL fell a little bit there. But in the statin arm, which I believe was uh, lovastatin, 20 milligrams, they lowered their LDL about 33%. And you can see with the portfolio diet, very, very similar to the uh, low dose of the statin. It's impressive. And it's, of course, not either or. It's all of the above to help somebody. Um, cholesterol, association between different types of plant-based diets and risk of dyslipidemia. A prospective cohort study of about 4,500 people out of Korea uh, with 14 years of follow up. They define dyslipidemia broadly, but uh, for the different quintile, as a healthy plant based diet, you had a 37% lower hazard of developing uh, high, high cholesterol or dyslipidemia, and an unhealthy plant based diet, a 48% increased hazard. Now, with LDL cholesterol, we know our apple B containing particles really when they burrow across the wall of the blood vessel to instigate the process or the endothelial cell uh, into the intima to, to begin the process of atherosclerosis, they'll become oxidized, which can make them particularly inflammatory um, and, and uh, creating oxidative stress. Well, in, in, uh, in, in vitro models, it is more difficult to oxidize the LDL particles of vegetarians versus omnivores, which is interesting. CRP inflammation, of course, promotes all aspects of atherosclerosis. And in an interesting randomized controlled trial out of NYU called Evade CAD, they took 100 subjects with stable coronary disease and randomized them to the American Heart Association diet versus a plant-based diet. And after eight weeks, CRP fell significantly more on a plant-based diet. How about blood pressure? Clearly, there are randomized controlled trials of the DASH diet, uh, which is largely, but not exclusively plant-based, but largely plant-based, which meaningfully lowers uh, blood pressure. Um, the Cardia Perspective Cohort Study shows with eating higher quintiles of plant-based diet is associated with lower blood pressure, um, so, uh, as well as cross-sectional analyses of the epic Oxford study. So a plant-based diet it can impact cardiovascular health, heart attack, stroke, erectile function. Uh, we talked about cholesterol, inflammation, blood pressure. What about weight? The weight's a tough one. But in an interesting cross-sectional analysis of uh, Seventh-day Adventists, the Seventh-day Adventist study, about 60,000 60, people. And as you know, the Seventh-day Adventists are a religious group. They treat their bodies like temples. And they have many healthy lifestyle measures. And even those who eat a Western-style diet among Seventh-day Adventists eat a much more healthful version of it than the typical Western. And if they, there are enough people here, they could slice and dice different dietary patterns, non-vegetarians, semi-vegetarians, pesco-vegetarians, lacto-vegetarians, and vegans. The group with the lowest BMI is the vegans, and it's really the only group with a normal BMI. Um, furthermore, in, in a really interesting randomized controlled trial by Dr. Turney McGreevy, and she does really wonderful stuff, 
Uh, it's small, but these are hard to do. A six month randomized controlled trial. They randomized uh, people to a vegan, vegetarian, pesco vegetarian, semi vegetarian, and omnivorous diet over six months. And after six months, the vegan group lost 7.5% of their body weight and significantly more than omnivores, semi vegetarians, and pesco vegetarians, but not significantly more than the vegetarians. Uh, so we touched on cardiovascular health, heart attack, stroke, erectile function cholesterol, inflammation, blood pressure, weight. What about diabetes? Well, um, in that same Seventh-day Adventist study, um, they looked what percentage of people have type 2 diabetes sliced and diced by the same dietary patterns. Well, the vegans had the lowest percentage. This is plant-based diet patterns and incidence of type 2 diabetes in U.S. men and women from three prospective cohorts, the Nurses Health Study 1 and 2 and the Physicians Health Study, with over 4 million person years of follow-up. And they looked at deciles. And if you were in the highest versus lowest decile of a, uh, a plant-based diet, you had a 34% lower hazard of incident diabetes. And if you were in the highest decile of an unhealthy plant-based diet versus lower, a 16% increased hazard. But you can, what about if you change your diet over the years along the themes of it's never too early to begin and never too late to start? Uh, changes in a plant-based diet index and subsequent risk of type 2 diabetes in men and women from the same three prospective cohorts. We have about 3 million person years of follow-up in this analysis. Each 10% increase in a healthy plant-based diet over four years was associated with a 9% lower risk of incident diabetes. So never too late to start. And this interesting cross-sectional analysis of the Seventh-day Adventist data, uh, looking at about 8,500 people, at least weekly intake versus none, weekly intake of, of animal product like meat, weekly intake of meat versus none, weekly intake of meat had a 74% higher or more, had a 74% higher odds of having diabetes. In this interesting randomized control trial of patients with adult onset diabetes, looking at 99 people for 22 weeks, they were randomized to either a plant-based diet or the American Diabetes Association diet. And you can see they lost more weight on the plant-based diet, their LDL cholesterol fell more on the plant-based diet. And for those subjects whose medications were not changed, their, the plant-based or vegan diet significantly lowered A1C more. For those who, who but uh, for those with no medication changes, but for everybody, including medication changes, the A1C fell only numerically more in the plant-based arm uh, compared to the American diabetes arm, not significantly so. Um, and while sometimes people say eating fruit causes diabetes, okay, well, Dr. Dew also looked at that in his analysis, and he asked, if you eat more fresh fruit, does it cause more diabetes, less diabetes? Well, in this Perspective cohort, eating more fresh fruit was associated with less incident diabetes in a, a cohort of 480,000 people. What about if you had diabetes at the get go? Is eating fruit bad? Well, they had 30,000 people in this cohort with diabetes at the get go. So if you ate more fresh fruit, it was associated with less, lower all cause mortality, even with diabetes at the get go. So we touched a bit on cardiovascular health, heart attack, stroke, stroke, erectile function, a bit on cholesterol, inflammation, blood pressure, a bit on weight, a bit on diabetes. What about some novel risk factors and quality of life? Well, some novel risk factors, uh, how about genes? Well, we all have our genes make our hair color, hair color, eye color, eye color. We can't change them. I guess I have to change that now because of CRISPR. So I guess we could change them a little bit. But for the most part, we can't change our genes. And, but you may be able to change which ones speak. And it's a really interesting analysis from Dr. Ornish's group. And they took men with early stage prostate cancer and 30 men, and they followed them for three months. It's not randomized. They, but they had them have a much healthier lifestyle for three months, eating almost exclusively a plant-based diet, psychosocial support, exercise. And they biopsied the prostate at the beginning and at the end, and they found that many pro-cancer genes were down-regulated in their expression after this lifestyle change, and many anti-cancer genes were up-regulated in their expression. So you can't change your genes, but you may be able to change which ones speak, making the healthy ones speak more loudly 
and the unhealthy ones speak more softly. It's pretty cool. What about the microbiome? Well, the as you know, it's an emerging area, uh, early days with this. There's probably about a trillion of them for each one of us. So you could say really that we're the parasites, not them. But it's pretty clear that a healthy microbiome pattern, which appears to be promoted by a high fiber plant-based diet and not with animal-based foods, um, promoting a healthful microbiome, these, when, they, when consuming the fiber, uh, the, the gut bacteria can promote, uh, create short chain fatty acids like butyrate, which can then seep into the intestinal wall, may downregulate cholesterol expression in the intestinal wall, can seep into the blood vessel, creating less inflammation, may lower diabetes risk, may improve vascular function, but it's early days. But it does appear that a more healthful microbiome pattern is promoted by a high fiber plant based diet. And I'll touch on endothelial progenitor cells here. We, um, you know, there, there's clear epidemiologic data, in particular with people with coronary disease, that if you have more endothelial progenitor cells in your blood, you do better, better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And as you know, our body recycles itself over time skin, uh, heart, endothelial cells, the older cells slough off and newer cells come in. And that's what the endothelial progenitor cells do. Um, and so they, yeah, they did this randomized trial. They took uh, young women from Okinawa and they randomized them to their usual diet or their usual diet plus more green leafy vegetables. And after two weeks, they were making significant, eating more green leafy vegetables. They made significantly more endothelial progenitor cells. So very interesting. How about quality of life? Now we often talk a lot about, you know, clearly interventions and medications and all these things are important as is, of course, as, as we all know, quality of life, but sometimes it can get lost a little bit in the conversation of stress, calf, et cetera. Um, and um, this study looked at changes in plant-based diet quality and health-related quality of life in women. And increases in a healthy plant-based diet was associated with improvements in both physical and mental health-related quality of life in women defined by the SF36 score. So the impact of a plant-based diet, we touched on cardiovascular health, heart, uh, coronary disease, stroke, erectile function, cholesterol, inflammation, blood pressure, weight, diabetes, novel risk factors, quality of life. And what about mortality? Does it impact mortality? It appears that it does. Changes in plant-based diet quality and total and cause specific mortality. This is a prospective cohort with about 725,000 person years of follow-up. And compared who's to uh, persons whose indices remain stable, among those with the highest quintile in plant-based diet score, uh, uh, that was associated with a healthy plant-based diet, a 10% lower hazard of mortality, and an unhealthy plant-based, highest quintile of an unhealthy plant-based diet, a 12% increased hazard of mortality. This is another interesting perspective cohort analysis, fruit and vegetable intake and mortality results from two prospective cohorts in US men and women and a meta-analysis of 26 cohort studies. So the two prospective cohorts, five versus two servings of fruits and vegetables a day was associated with about a 13% lower hazard of mortality. And the meta-analysis of 26 cohorts with almost 2 million subjects from 29 countries, so obviously a diverse patient population, the five versus two similar 13% reduction in mortality. So that's pretty impressive. And a separate meta-analysis of 16 prospective cohort studies of about 800,000 people, each serving a fruit and vegetable day was associated with about a 5% reduction in mortality. And you don't have to have perfection be the enemy of good. Um, you know, in this interesting uh, analysis where uh, they looked at um, of, of, where there, of, of about 130,000 people with 3.5 million person years of follow-up, uh, they asked, if you replace just 3% of your calories from plant-based protein with 3% of calories, or excuse me, replace 3% of your calories from animal-based protein with 3% of calories from plant-based protein, is that good? Is it not good? Turns out in this analysis, it's good. Replacing 3% of your calories from processed red meat with 3% of calories from plant-based protein is associated with a 34% lower hazard of death. Unprocessed red meat, 12. Poultry, 6. Eggs, 19. Uh, dairy, uh, 8%. Uh, so pretty impressive. So he doesn't, you don't have to have perfection be the enemy of good. And I'll be very happy if my patients even go 25% more plant-based. 
Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on, which comes up a lot, is the animal-based ketogenic diet. And I stress animal-based because there's less data on a plant-based ketogenic diet, and there may be some, some benefit there, but the jury's out. Um, with an animal-based ketogenic diet or an animal-based low-carbohydrate dietary pattern, I'm uh, not a, a, a huge fan of it. Um, I think the underlying basis of it is based on a popular myth. And that popular myth is in 1980, they told us to eat low fat. So look at us now, we ate low fat, and we're fat and sick. Well, they may have, they told us to eat low, they told us to eat low fat, but we didn't do that. We ate more of everything. So the underpinning of that is just, I think, fake news. Um, there's no long living society that lives in a state of chronic ketosis. Um, the Inuit population is often romanticized as eating lots of fish and living a really, really long time without heart disease. It's not true. They do eat fish and, and uh, you know, they live, they're circumpolar, uh, living very far north. It's tough to get produce up there. But in a more modern study, looking at their cardiovascular event rates compared to an average Canadian, it's about the same. And actually, they have a mutation that makes it a little bit harder to go into a state of ketosis, suggesting that being in a chronic state of ketosis is not a survival advantage. Um, and the blue zones, of course, those are five uh, areas in, across the globe with the most centenarians, one being in, in the US, Loma Linda, California with the Seventh-day Adventists. And they have the most centenarians and their diet is more than 50% carbs. Now, clearly there's more to it. They have psychosocial support, physical activity, but they're the longest living populations and their diet is more than 50% carbohydrate, complex carbs. Uh, the Simone people, it's a very interesting, and they were published, there, there's an article about them in Lancet in 2017. They're an indigenous population in uh, the jungles of Bolivia with the lowest rates of heart disease ever recorded in the medical literature. And their diet is 72% complex carbs. Lowest rates of cor coronary disease ever recorded in the medical literature, 72% carbs. Uh, and it's 14% animal protein, 14% fat, and the animal protein they're eating, they're literally catching wild monkeys. Now, obviously it's multifactorial, they, they are physically active, and interestingly, they have high levels of, or higher levels of inflammation, because oftentimes they'll be barefoot and they'll have uh, some parasitic infections in their feet. Um, and if you look at this small, interesting uh, randomized trial by Dr. Uh, Kevin Hall out of the NIH, a feeding war study, they randomized people to an animal-based keto diet versus a low-fat plant-based diet for two weeks, just 20 people, two weeks. And one of the big things about the, the uh, low-carb or ketogenic diet is that there's something that they say something about being in a state of ketosis that reduces appetite. Okay, so this was an ad-lib feeding study. And they found, at least for these two weeks, that for the entire two weeks, ad-lib eating, whatever you wanted, however much you wanted, people uh, on the low-fat dietary, the plant-based low-fat, ate fewer calories than did the ketogenic diet. If you look at some of their secondary endpoints, LDL cholesterol fell significantly more in the plant-based low-fat arm. Triglycerides was higher than in the plant-based arm. Glucose about the same, and CRP fell significantly more in the plant-based arm. And a variety of epidemiologic studies also support having an animal-based low-carb dietary pattern may not be helpful, including this one from Dr. Lee published in Circulation in 2014, where post-MI patients consuming more of an animal-based low-carb diet actually had worse outcomes. And of course, when you're eating that way, you're leaving out some of the healthiest foods around, whole grains, which of course that Reynolds meta-analysis in, in Lancet with 135 million person years of follow-up suggests that more whole grains is healthful by a variety of health metrics. Pulses, beans, and lentils are associated with living longer. Fruits associated with living longer. If you look at different nutrients by dietary pattern, plant-based versus Mediterranean versus an animal-based low-carb pattern, uh, and the plant-based is equal parts of tomatoes, spinach, lima bean, peas, and potatoes. Mediterranean is 40% uh, of the plant-based food and half a piece of skinless chicken, one teaspoon of olive oil and one cup of 1% milk. The low carb is equal parts beef, pork, chicken, and whole milk. In terms of cholesterol, your body makes all you need. You don't need to eat any. How about protein? Plant-based, low carb. Oh my God, my muscles are gonna fall apart tomorrow. You don't have to take my word for it. You could take Patrick Baboumian's word for it. He's vegan and he's the world's strongest man. How do I know he's the world's strongest man? because he won the world's strongest man in contest. That's how I know. How about beta carotene? It's subtle, 
dietary fiber, your constipation will go away. Iron, I'm going to become anemic tomorrow. Calcium, my bones are going to fall apart. This is a great quote. Today, no one can deny the possibility of adequate nutrition and the prolonged maintenance of health and vigor on a vegetarian diet. That's from JAMA in 1912. Um, and also wholly consistent with the current Association of Nutrition and Dietetics and recommendations. They are basically the ACC for nutritionists and dietitians. And they state that a well-planned vegan diet is healthful throughout the life cycle. And well-planned means you know, taking B12. Another great quote from Dr. Kim Williams, past president of the American College of Cardiology. I recommend a plant-based diet because I know it's going to have my patients lower their blood pressure, improve their insulin sensitivity, and decrease their cholesterol. And he's also gone on to say, and I've confirmed this quote with him, that he said that there are two kinds of cardiologists, vegans and those who have not read the literature. Now, there are societal level um, impacts, of course, as well. Uh, there's environmental, animal agribusiness creates more greenhouse gases than all transportation combined, including cars. Uh, and really, who cares how healthy you are if there's no planet? No planet, no health. So uh, that can impact that as well. And various models demonstrate that eating more plant based nutrition can reduce healthcare costs. And this interesting model from the UK and Belgium, where wider implementation of a plant-based eating would lead to large net economic gains for society and improved health outcomes for the population. So this is where we are here up in the Bronx in New York City. And you may know that Eric Adams was elected mayor of New York City. His health story as well described in the New York Times. He's vegan. He um, had a wonderful turnaround in his health. And actually, um, public schools now in New York City are going to go vegan on Fridays. So maybe it's meatless Mondays and vegan Fridays. And this is where our wellness program is based with an educational arm, a clinical arm, and a research arm. Uh, and uh, so we'd be very happy to talk more about it perhaps in the Q&A uh, session. So we talked a bit about uh, the impact of a plant-based diet on cardiovascular health, cholesterol, inflammation, and blood pressure, weight, diabetes, novel risk factors, quality of life, and mortality. And, and thank you, Dr. Borsheimer, for mentioning that cardio nutrition podcast that we uh, developed with the American College of Cardiology, about 15, 10 to 20 minute interviews about different dietary patterns and guidelines, really wonderful. It's an honor, real, real privilege to be a part of that. And uh, it's not too hard to find. And please take a listen if you're interested. So thank you very much. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Rosfeld, for uh, another very, I think, affirming talk about what we can do uh, personally and professionally to mitigate the epidemic of cardiovascular disease. I think in the interest of the recording now, we're going to go off the recording and, and we'll deal with the questions offline. So, uh, Millie, if you could just stop the recording now. No, actually, I would like to include the recording for purposes of education. Okay. So there are a couple of questions which have come through uh, the chat, which I'll um, come back to you in a second. Um, so I guess the first question is, if, Rob, if you could go back to your title slide. Why do you have a question mark? The reason that I put a question, it's a great question. And the reason that I put a question mark there is because we lack multiple large randomized controlled trials. There are multiple small randomized control. There's a legion of evidence from uh, test tube data to translational data to multiple diverse epidemiologic data to small randomized controlled trials, but we lack we, we don't have a pre-med study for plant-based nutrition. So always important to not get ahead, fully ahead of the data, but I think the data unequivocally supports a plant-based diet as would the American College of Cardiology guidelines. So to that end, just to, you know, something that our patients I think say often, which is, you know, you cited the famous study, the small study, I guess, but the well-known study, which looked at the comparison of statins versus, um, diet, a more aggressive plant-based diet in a fairly small uh, cohort of people. And I think the statin that you mentioned was Lovastatin. 
which yeah. was essentially a lot of what um, when Ornish was doing the, the trials that he had, which were evidence based. But I think you know the question would be in the modern world if you repeated this study with you know rastuvastatin with Zedia with a PCS K9, putting aside the theotropic benefits of a uh, plant-based diet that you alluded to, cancer, oncogenes, diabetes, all the other things that are part of the benefit of a plant-based diet. From a purely cardiovascular question, you know, patients say, you know, what's the big deal if my LDL is, is 50 this way or 50 that way? What's the difference? It's a good question. Uh, we, don't, we don't have that data. I can extrapolate um, there from, if you look at the COURAGE trial, stable coronary disease, optimal medical therapy, it's a little bit of an older trial now, but they got LDLs to about the low 70s. Okay, their cardiovascular event rate was about 19% over four and a half years. If I compare that, now it's apples and oranges here. Dr. Esselstyn published a case series of 200 subjects who went plant-based. Um, some of them indeed had statins, they also, but they all were plant-based. And I think the follow-up was about three and a half years. They, they, they and their LDL also got into the 70s on average. They concluded that their event rate was 0.6%. Now let's say, because it's a case series, not as rigorous as Courage, let's say they're off by a factor of 10, okay? So then it's a 6% event rate compared to 19 with similar LDL levels. So, you know, it appears that from a cardiovascular event rate, if you, you know, this is an apples and oranges and an extrapolation, but there are benefits from a cardiovascular perspective beyond LDL that can give you uh, a lower event rate. Great. Um, I've heard you, you know, answer the fellows this question. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Mark Menegas. Uh, great talk, Rob, thank you. What constitutes, quote, an unhealthy plant-based diet? It's, yeah, I mean, uh, Great question. Now, I mean, so, you know, sugar cookies, uh, indeed, highly, you know, chips are plant-based, highly processed foods. There's lots of, there are plenty of uh, vegan snacks, cakes. Uh, they're not helpful. And, and one that comes up a lot are those replacement burgers. I don't want to mention any brands, but, you know, there's the replacement burgers are certainly great from you know, an ethical perspective, if that matters to someone from an environmental perspective, um, but I don't consider them a health food. There was an interesting study called Swap Meat out of Stanford where they randomized people to like an animal-based burger versus a plant-based burger, one of the more common brands that you would know, and cholesterol fell a little bit more on the plant-based burger. But those I don't consider a health food. I consider them either a gateway drug to eating more healthfully, or, and I don't think any physician in the plant-based movement would consider them a health food. So a gateway drug to eating more healthfully or a treat. We have another question from Juan Terry, which um, I'm gonna just expand a little bit. Great talk, Rob. Um, obviously, I would say 10, 15 years ago, we had a number of trials mechanistically looking at the way uh, statins impact um, the vascular tree, and particularly at either regression or plaque stabilization. Um, what is the data for CAD regression or stabilization with a plant, um, plant-based bot? Yeah, it's a great question and an area of a lot of debate. Um, and I wanna, since some of the faculty are, I'm gonna wanna mention something else, just can you remind me at the end real quick. In terms of regression, there's a lot of debate about that. Now it's technically defined as 10% or more shrinkage in a blockage. Um, and uh, Dr. Ornish did his randomized trial. And although they did, and, and in his randomized trial, people with stable coronary disease, 
they significantly lowered angina, uh, they had overall improved outcomes, and they had something like, this is coronary angiography, this is many, many years ago, a one or 2% regression in the lesion. Um, so some people will say that counts as regression. Many people think it does not because it's not 10%. Uh, so it's wonderful, the improved outcomes and the improved symptoms, but it is, uh, you know, I, I don't think that constitutes regression, maybe stabilization. And of course, as you know, with more modern studies with better imaging, like the yellow studies um, or evaporate, uh, which uh, Dr. Slipchik was just talking with me about the other day, uh, particularly in yellow where they did OCT, opt op optical coherence tomography, where you can really look at the plaque. And they had people in a high dose statin over, I think it's three months, and the plaque itself became a healthier plaque, a less, what we think is a healthier plaque, a less, uh, the fibrous cap would get bigger, less, less uh, lipid in the plaque. So we don't know. So we don't know if, and I'm not, I'm not aware of statin uh, trials showing more than a 10% regression. So certainly plaque stability, certainly reduced outcomes. We're using them appropriately like water. And if someone knows that the more than a 10% regression, please let me know. I'm just not aware of that. Uh, but we don't have that kind of granular imaging data with a plant-based diet. And people are talking about doing exactly that kind of thing. And so I think, you know, so that, that actually, that awareness, as you correctly, I think, pointed out, you know, dates back to Lance Gould's trial in the mid, you know, I guess, 1990s, looking at the 1% regret and even the, the, the CAS trial um, with nominal changes in lumen diameter correlating with enormous reductions in cardiovascular events. But I think, you know, to sort of flesh out Juan's question a little bit further, um, in, in, in the modern era, I think the, the imaging studies have taught us that what statins really do is they don't achieve regression, they change the composition of plaques. You know, certainly we showed that at Sinai 20 years ago with MRIs of, um, of the aorta, it's carotid data. Is there any data along those lines with changes in plaque or plaque stabilization without changes in the diameter? Um, which, as you point out, are not really what we should be looking for any further. I'm not aware of uh, plaque imaging data with a plant-based diet, and um, people want to do that. There are, I think, there are people who are in the planning stages of doing that kind of study. I'm not aware of one that's been done with that kind of granular imaging. Um, and it stands to reason, of course, you know, if you think, first of all, if you just think of a, a blockage like a static thing, which obviously it's not. You know, uh, blood flow is related to the fourth power of the radius. So a teeny bit of regression is a lot more flow if you think about it statically. And of course, it's not static. You know, the endothelial cells, if they get healthier, eating more healthful foods can make more nitric oxide, dilate up a little bit more. And there are a variety of brachial reactivity studies that show that if you eat a healthy meal, your um, brachial reactivity, the blood vessels can dilate up more in the arm. And an unhealthy meal, they don't dial it up more, but it lasts about six hours. You know, so there's reason to believe that if you ate more healthfully, it would have a similar kind of impact on the coronary arteries, but that's speculation. Question here from Carlos Rodriguez, great presentation. Um, and can you basically, to sort of paraphrase the question, can you speak at all about the literature regarding plant-based diet impact in other cardiovascular conditions, such as congestive heart failure, um, atrial fibrillation, and it says patients with existing CHD, although I think you covered that. So let's yeah. focus on heart failure and atrial fibrillation. So heart failure, I'm not a, there is a little bit of data, Dr. Lara out of, in Jack, a few years ago out of the REGARDS database, published that uh, if consuming a plant, there was like a a Southern dietary pattern, a plant-based dietary pattern, and a couple of other dietary patterns. And basically the more of a plant-based dietary pattern you ate was associated with less incident heart failure admissions. There is also a, and it stands to reason improving endothelial function, lowering blood pressure, lowering cholesterol, the, the risk, the less obesity, the risk factors for heart failure would, would theoretically improve. 
There's also a similar large prospective cohort study that found a similar thing, which I'll try to, which actually I texted to Dr. Lara uh, the other day, and I can't remember the study exactly. Uh, um, yeah, it was the DASH diet. Um, I'm pulling it up on my computer. Uh, the DASH diet is associated with a lower risk of, of heart failure, a prospective cohort study published in the European Journal of Preventive Cardiology just this January. Uh, so I don't, I apologize, I don't remember more of the details about it, uh, but they had about 41,000 people in the cohort. So there's epidemiologic data to support it, and the same kind of underpinning pathophysiologic data would go along with that. I have a couple of cases, I mean, these are cases, and we published one as a case report, uh, heart failure uh, and a plant-based diet case report and literature review in the uh, front, frontiers in nutrition, where, you know, someone went plant-based and their EF went from like, I don't know, 25 to 55, um, but it's just one case. So hard to know what to do with that. Um, and, and of course, if it's lower in cardiovascular event rates, then cardiomyopathy of coronary disease would, would happen less. So that's it with heart failure. Uh, and atrial fibrillation, we certainly know that from the LEGENDS trial out of Australia, that weight loss, 10% or more weight loss can reduce recurrence, and, but that's just weight loss, period, after ablation. Um, I don't know, there's prop, there, there's an epidemiologic study showing more of an animal-based keto diet that was presented as an abstract at either HA or ACC showing more animal-based keto, they had more AFib. And I just can't think of one off the top of my head. I'm sure there's a prospective cohort study looking at that endpoint, but I just don't know off the top of my head. And then one final sort of practical question, a whole bunch. Um, what can you eat as a vegan keto diet? Um, and maintain health in diabetic patients, fruits do raise sugar in diabetes. Um, should we address that or ignore it? What about dry fruits, cashews, almonds, walnuts? Are they okay and how much? So I do think that uh, just in general, eating fruits and diabetes is good. The, the Dr. Dew uh, uh, demonstrated that in that epidemiologic study, the randomized trial, the plant-based diet versus which had fruit versus the American Diabetes Association, they did better with the, with a the plant-based diet. Now, clearly, if, if someone in the very early stages, if you eat fruit, uh, particularly more of the tropical fruit, like higher glycemic index fruit, like bananas versus berries, which are lower, you know, sugar will go up. So what I typically do with someone who might be quite overweight is I'll ask them just to maybe have a couple servings of fruit, preferably berries, till they lose a little bit of weight, do a little bit of physical activity and begin to improve their insulin sensitivity and then have at it with the fruit. So I hear you in the short term, that can be an issue, but I've got no issue with that long term at all. But if someone wants to go uh, keto, you, you of course can have a little bit of, of low glycemic index fruits, but typical food, and it's well published online, like what people eat, but healthful oils, like an olive oil, canola oil, nuts, avocado, seeds, the more healthful nuts, I think are like walnuts, uh, but, but cashews is a part of that um, as well. I don't see any further new questions in the comments of the chat. So once again, um, I wanna thank Dr. Osfeld for an inspiring presentation. And I think a, a really great way to kick off our uh, heart month here at Montefiore. So thanks to everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you so much. There's one thing I wanted to add just for any faculty still on the line. As you know, in our the consult notes for the fellows, we have a line that says, does the patient consume uh, four to five servings of fruits and vegetables a day? Yes, no deferred. It's right above the assessment and plan. So that's good real estate. And we have it there. So the fellows think about it. Hopefully the patients hear about it and anyone reading the note thinks about it. So encouraging the fellows to ask about that. It's wholly consistent with the HAACC guidelines. Thank you.